Welcome back to Stories Out of Time and Space. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and as always, I'm joined by Julian Darius. Julian, how are you doing? You okay? I'm fine, but these bees, they're coming to get me. It's like uh, Hitchcock's The Birds, but with bees. You mean The Swarm, starring Michael Caine. Mm. Uh, Yes, yes, we are talking about the last episode, the sort of the big episode, like the finale of of season three of um, Black Mirror, uh, hated in the nation. It's like a feature-length episode. Uh, in the near future, in near future London, police detective Karen Park and her tech-savvy sidekick Blue investigate a string of mysterious deaths with a sinister link to social media. Uh, and each death, obviously, caused by um, a bee is what it's found to be. But they're not bees; they're bee drones. Um, because there's an ecological disaster and they've created these bee drones to replace bees. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out and say, I love this episode. I was well into this. Like, you know, I didn't know this is an hour and a half. As I've said always, I go into these cold. Like, I just say, I'm like, go, and I'm going to learn something. Um, I, I'm a, I am a sucker for British detective TV shows uh, and the tropes that come with them. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I was well. I was well into this. Like I was really kind of like, I love a good mystery. Um, I think the technology um, is handled. It's it's science fiction enough without being. You know, it's not going to be like completely otherworldly, um, and it fits into the 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 um, the story. But I also kind of like the ending that like is kind of personal and not so much dark, but is is this idea of consequence. Uh, is good. So I was, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this, uh, of this episode. What were your thoughts, Julian? Yeah, to me, I, I sort of feel the same way. Um, I maybe like it a little less than you. It sort of strikes me as emotionally flat. Um, mm. I don't feel as engaged as I want to, but I sort of feel like it is an exceptional thriller. Mm. You know, and that's what it is. It's got science fiction tropes, but what it really is is a thriller. And yes, it's a detective thriller. I can, you know, have a few objections here and there, but it's a thriller with a lot of twists. It packs an awful lot into its runtime. And I think it's really kind of like a uh, Charlie Brooker audition for writing for Hollywood, writing the next Mission Impossible or something, which he can clearly do. Um, mm. I just think it's it's kind of a, a masterclass in, in, you know, a, an unraveling thriller. Yeah, I agree. I think that's how it works so well. I mean, the one thing I say, although these have increased budget, being with Netflix, this one, you know, they're, they're still not movie level um, budgets, and so you know, there's there are at least two or three scenes in this where I'm like, oh man, like you say, if they upped the budget just a little bit, this would have been insane like you know towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the episode but other than that like i'm really satisfied with the way it works well let's talk about that because i i really love the scene with the um with the bees where they have constructed the corporate logo yeah that's cool um, you know that looks great and it's such a hollywood touch right yeah. it's such a just it doesn't serve any purpose for the plot except you know, to look good. No. The shots of that corporate uh, area, you know, look fantastic. Um, there are a lot of shots of buildings where the buildings are comp- like are composed like honeycombs mm-hmm. and are really beautiful buildings, but echo those honeycombs. And I immediately aesthetically tune to them. They're shot in high resolution. And my only complaint 
My only complaint, so I'm interested to hear where you feel that like a budget comes from. My only complaint is there, I mean, besides there are a lot of locations, but my only complaint is uh, that we don't see the mass carnage at the end. That, you know, even a little bit, even if it feels a little low budget, would go a long way for me. I agree. Sort of, There's, you know, that's, quick yeah. cuts of 12 people dying, you know, would, would do a lot for me. Yeah. The two things I was really, I'm really thinking of is when they're in the safe house in the countryside, the, the swarm of bees that is coming for them. You have the guy Rasmus in the, um, the what's it going like, there's thousands of them. And then you see Benedict Wong, who also I love. I mean, the cast in this, I love a lot of the cast from other things I've seen him in. And I love Benedict Wong. And he he sort of drops his phone, and you're like, oh my god, what is it? And it you get the second shot of the of the of the swarm, and although it's big, it doesn't feel dense dense or big enough to feel like a full threat. Where I'm like, oh okay, like I mean, it, it is a threat, but it doesn't feel like. It doesn't feel like it, you know. It should be like a shadow coming across the landscape, you know, mm. kind of thing. Like that's the one thing. But the other one is the end. But they, they basically tell you, uh, and we're not going to talk about the week that followed this thing. And I'm going like, no, don't talk about it. Show me. Like I want to see mm-hmm. at least like these this these millions of bees descending on on Britain and you know killing these people off and all this other stuff and I'm like you've sort of alluded to it with the teacher but I want you know there's obviously going to be there's going to be casualties because it could be like one of them could have been like a bus driver or like an airplane airplane pilot or like that the teacher like how many kids were accidentally killed in you know stampeding out of the class or something like that like there's other things that could happen so how, how many nobles were killed? How many members of parliament? The queen, you know, the, yeah, the of of, yeah, exactly. The queen was killed off and you're like, wow, could not, you know, Liz was really popular, was really busy on uh, <laughs> uh, Twitter. Um, she had a secret Twitter profile that let yeah. her fox Mac come out. That's, yeah. Um, but other than that, but you're right. I mean, that that's the only thing. And these are niggles. These are absolute niggles. Where I'm like, no, if you're a bit big, bigger budget, like you could make this look really, really glossy, but it doesn't need that. What I would say is, I love the escalation of this, and this is one of those things that I think, you know, of uh, with Brooker's other stuff, like they'll drop you in something, and then it's sort of like you catch up, or you know, which I like as well. But they tell you, we've said before, like they're telling a story that you sort of like is a twist, right? There's a twist at the end. This is less about the twist. And there is a twist, but it's less about the twist, more about, as you said, that thriller escalation. Like it starts with the mystery of um, Joe Powers, this sort of journalist who has written something about a disabled activist who is, you know, and there's this hate campaign against her and then her murder. And then then the investigation comes and it turns to this uh, this rapper and then sort of starts to to escalate. Um, And I just like this thing of like the, the the. how it the connections build to make it um, escalate to become this thing at the end where three hundred eighty-seven thousand people are going to die from drone bees, and I, I, you know it it's paced really well. It feels you know well done, but even when they reveal like the motivation, like you know you're like, well that's crazy, but you know it sort of tracks. Like it all feels. Yeah, no, I, I just think this is like you said. This is this is Hollywood writing, but done in a, 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 a kind of a well done, nice pace without it being flashy. Do you know what I mean? This isn't driven by the need to be a blockbuster. Mm. This is just a well told story, um, and I like well, all the connections and, of, and stuff. Yeah, you're right, and and one of the ways that it it does that very well is in that escalation because it starts as a single murder, and there's the sort of like grumpy old cop and the new cop right so the grumpy old cop is like yeah you know most police work is dull um so there's an acknowledgement of that even though you're going to get lots of exciting scenes right uh because they've happened to stumble into this case that's bigger than they dare imagine um i am annoyed by the uh you know by the newer cops technological prowess you know which seems infinite you know, it's a little bit of a trope of like the the tech guy who can do anything. The, young, the younger person that's a bit more tech savvy than the old, the old detective right. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But but I do want to point out that I mean there are there are just wonderful uh, Blade Runner esque 
you know, uh, shots with a, with a different, brighter aesthetic, um, you know, of the two of them, you know, going into that facility and everything. And it also manages, because of that unraveling uh, of, or escalation, it manages to justify its small cast. Mm -hmm. So you don't see lots of police officers, you don't see lots of, you know, workers at this company, but you know, you have representatives of all of them, which is the classic Hollywood way of doing it. And until the very end, I'm not really bothered by that. Um, but again, that that is a that is a very small point. Um, but I think it's sort of expert in how it manages to do that, which even Hollywood movies do to save money and to emotionally ground the story. Yeah, I think that, I think that the I'm going to say because I'm just looking. Obviously, this is written by Brooker. Uh, and directed by a guy called James Hawes. And I was just checking, and James Hawes has done a lot of television and this other stuff, and obviously, you know, that's a Brooker. But I think what this what this leans into, we, we obviously, we're saying, like, Hollywood and stuff. There's this, this is actually still leaning into um, British detective TV show tropes, and, and American. I mean, there's, you know, you still have, like, everything from Columbo to... Um, you know, elementary or whatever, those sort of like castle or whatever. All those shows have got those sort of like detective tropes. And but British have got that sort of like as you said, that the grumpy one and the not so grumpy one. Like, you know, that's that is from back to the Sweeney and, and Z cars, like those things of the seventies. Up to now, like that is a st staple of British detective uh to but and that's what it feels like this fit this feels like like this feels like it could be a you know like this is a this is the pilot episode of um you know park and colson or like you know karen and blue like that this is going to continue like if this you know obviously it ends a certain way and that thing like but like i could see this being like oh they did they solve this crime and then next week they're off to another crime and they're going to join the the you know and, and uh, benedict wong's uh, sean lee is going to turn up as a recurring character sort of thing like this feels like those, you know, and that's why I think it works because it's not going, this is a big blockbuster and we've got to have all these big explosions and we've got to have someone running across the top of St. Paul's Cathedral and we've got to have this and we've got to have that. <laughs> like, it's like, no, this is a detective story. It's going to have these TV kind of tropes and, but we're going to add in this kind of apocalyptic level event. And I'm like, yeah, cool. That's, what I'm going to enjoy about this. That's why I think it works. Well, it also has this framing sequence that kind of ties it together. Of, mm. You know, the grumpy cop testifying. Um, I would say for me, if it does feel more like a blockbuster and maybe that's because I'm an American, it's just because it ends with this apocalyptic event. And one of the two cops has faked her own death, you know, to, to get revenge. Um, so it definitely feels more like an ending to me. Um, oh no, it is. You know, but I say, like, yeah, I agree yeah. with that it is. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, you mentioned the motivation of the antagonist. While obviously he's not a main character and he's not really explored, um, there are a lot of things in this that are those tropes that are done well. So, mm -hmm. for example, like he, there's the classic sort of, um, especially post Dark Knight, like the villain wanted to be captured, you know, sort of trope where like, yeah, he wanted to be raided and, and have this hard drive fall under uh, police scrutiny in order to upload this, this new command to the system. Mm. But that works pretty well. Mm. Um, it, it makes more sense here than it does in, you know, the dark Knight, frankly, or, or, you know, uh, Star Trek into darkness and, and things like that. Um, the other thing is this sort of like ending that's very Silence of the Lambs with sort of following somebody, yeah. you know, that clearly is echoing that. But it's a case of somebody taking revenge who clearly has been traumatized and broken by if I had not taken these actions, 300,000 people, give or take, would be alive today, mm. um, which is going to be devastating. And really hunting down the person responsible. And I love that text message at the end, which says, got him. Yeah. And then it's deleted. And this kind of like unseen moment where in most him. productions, <laughs> yeah, but in most productions, this would be um, 
much more dramatic. The the text matches wouldn't be deleted. This seems very sort of Jean Le Carré. Like, you mm. know, this is how it's really done. The good guys won, or at least got their revenge at the end. But um, what? but it yeah. was done in this very subtle, nobody notices, nobody gets a wreath kind of way. Yeah. One of the things I like about the whole um, blue character, blue Coulson, is and again because this not only does it, is it the arcs in this like there are character arcs in this and blues is the is the one I enjoy the most because she comes in like the puppy dog doesn't she like she comes into the sort of the murder scene the Joe Powers and she's like look at the computer she sort of like she kneels down and sort of like nods at the body as if like she knows what she's doing and everyone like the the two more experienced cops are like oh god like we've got to you know walk her through this like she's our shadow kind of thing. And as she goes through it, she becomes more hardened. And there's a line, because it cuts back to this um, testimony that's been given by by Karen Park, the, the more grumpy, the more experienced police officer. And they talk about when um, they go to the safe house for this woman, the, the woman who'd done something stupid to the um, uh, Clara Me- uh, Meads, you know, the woman that had done the, you know, look, she'd peeing on a, a, a memorial. And they get the bees get in and they kill her. And the the one of the women at the, the, the jury or grand whatever they are at this testimony says, Well, how did and how did Detective Coulson take it? And she says all she says is Blue took it hard. Mm. And that's mm-hmm. it. And it sort of foreshadows that like that's the moment where like it tipped the balance. Like, you know, she was then committed to this case. And it was never going to end well for Blue Coulson. Like that's that thing of like, no, seeing this young woman die in her arms was the thing that really broke her. And then to sort of like the three hundred eight, the three hundred eighty seven thousand are almost equal to that one that died in her arms. You know, like I feel that like she would have done the same thing at the end if it was just this one woman. But that three hundred eighty seven thousand sort of like confirms it. Like that's this guy's got to die. So I like that, that her arc is like she starts out as this sort of like optimist of being out in the field, as she calls it, making real change, results in her, you know, going out and hunting this guy down in Spain. Um, I love that arc. I think she's she's a you know a fascinating character. Yeah, and I think she works. And, mm. and I think that, you know, to, to get back to that point about the um, antagonist here, you find out that he um, saved the life of his, uh, you know, paramour, uh, who he wasn't really with. He's kind of a, you know, a little bit of an incel kind of mm-hmm. you know, type. But he, because she had been bullied on social media. And so there's this question, like, why would you then become the Billy and kill people on social media? And of course, that's revealed in the, in the big twist, um, you know, that, of course, He's going to kill everybody who was willing to vote to kill somebody. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, to that point, you know, it reminds me of one of the things I love most about film noir, uh, which is that it doesn't end happily. <laughs> you yeah. Know, there's no happy ending here, even though the good guys are victorious in getting their revenge. Um, 300 plus thousand people have died. Uh, there's been a sort of, uh, you know, which for the British population is much bigger yeah. than if that happened here. So, I mean, this is really um, fundamentally catastrophic. The good guys lose and fail. And you have this unraveling of this case that you find out is of a massive scale and importance. Mm. And you uncover a government conspiracy along the way and all of this. And, the good guys then lose, and they, you know, and are unable to stop it. And that seems very, you know, very Brooker and, and very much like I'm so sick of the good guys have to win everything and be yeah. triumphant and appear heroic and all of the, that kind of nonsense. So I think you're right about those character arcs, um, you know, and I, I really appreciate what this is doing with the thriller structure in those respects. Oh, yeah, no, I do. And I think it, I think, yeah, it, it holds back as well as well as giving. And I think like the Benedict Wong character, um, 
does really well. You know, he represents does it the National Crime Association, which is not like sort of exists, but like was it was being presented as sort of the big thing, like the British FBI at one point. Um, and he yeah. obviously represents that. And you like you say, you find out that they're actually the bees that were being funded by the government was being funded because they're actually sort of also seeded with um surveillance technology surveillance software and then it feels obvious nowadays we'd be like yeah, of course they've done that like you know and, and i think one of the characters in blue even says it like well they're tracking us through everything else so of course you're tracking us through the beats um and they get really head up about it and i like that like say karen park's response is yeah the government's a cunt let's move on but like, we know that <laughs> that's her response and you're just like yeah all right um but what's interesting is he he's like he says like, well, I couldn't give you. He's like, that's classified. Like, he's that character. Like, he wants the best outcome, but he can't give certain information, and has hindered them along the way. And what's interesting is like, you know, it's clear he's called to testify after her. She leaves, and you see him sit down, but you don't see his testimony. So you don't know if he's going to contradict or back her up. But there's clearly going to be these questions around surveillance and all this other thing, and it calls into question this thing around surveillance. And his point, he, he makes his point. We get gets trotted out of but we stopped all these crimes and it's actually what people want. They may not know they want it, but it's what they want to feel safe. Um, so I, I like that character as well, this idea of the government sort of like being involved and it's sort of being a sort of thing. But what I find interesting after all of this, like this idea of the truth and about sort of like, you know, we, we as the viewer know more because we've been in the room mm -hmm. with these characters. But then as, as uh, Park is leaving at the end, but she gets that text and there's those people sort of like protesting on either side of the entrance and there's like, they're back smacking on the car. There, there's still that like, um, you know, we want the truth, hashtag, you know, truth and all this other stuff. Like it's this thing of going like, after everything that's happened, it's still going on. Like, you know, and I'm sure there'll be like conspiracy theories and all this other stuff mm -hmm. online. And just that moment sort of tells me that, like, yeah, this one event isn't going to stop this 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 mentality, this human condition that exists on social media. Like, there's still going to be this, you know, this cancel culture, as this really is sort of laying into on social media. Like, that ends with this thing of, like, again, that cynicism of, like, we haven't solved anything in this episode. Like, it's still going to exist. Um, people don't really believe it. Um and so, yeah, I like, I like that. And the media, I was going to say, because the media, I, I, um, sorry, I'm going to shut up in a minute. I'll let you talk. But I was just going to say, because this whole point about how the media present it as well, like there's this thing when they when they learn about it and you have all the, the, the top five people with the, the hashtag death to uh, hashtag on it. Mm. And like one mm -hmm. of them is the minister. And like, we'll get into that in a bit. But I like the way there's like, there's like a morning TV show and they're the ones bringing up the top five people and talking about it felt like this felt, in this section, very connected to National Anthem, like the very first episode. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm like, cool, you're hearkening back to themes and ideas that you've done in previous episodes, and I'm, and I'm liking all this. So, sorry, I'll stop there. Any thoughts around that part? No, but uh, hearkening back, but with a new spin. I mean, mm. and, and they both are obviously more political. They both have nation in the title. Um, you know, but have very different things to say. And I think that ending was sort of like, yeah, social media is still going to go on, um, is, you know, also sort of subverting the Hollywood trope where, where you sort of have to have this gesture at the end of the film to like, we should rethink how we treat each other on social media, you know, as if that's really going to change for more than a week, yeah. you know. Um, I also did love that, you know, um, series where you see on tv like the top five ranked and they're sort of moving and it's like you know right you know who's gonna die tonight the media's already with the graphics and everything and that seems very realistic to me mm. um so you know let's talk about some of these issues that this brings up i mean the first you mentioned is surveillance mm. and obviously i mean that's been an issue especially seen as a british issue for you know at least 20 years uh mm. probably 30 more yeah, yeah. Um, yeah i mean i remember when the cctv cameras were going up all over london and it was yeah. international news you know that was blair and, and that was it was blair that introduced that well and there's talk of like a panopticon a mm. surveillance society and all of this and now it's kind of like yeah 
you know, we live with that. That's okay. I mean, you know, they have recently put up uh, more of the cameras in, in Waikiki to deter crime, you know, where I live. And I'm all for it, you know? So, I mean, I, I sort of feel like on that issue where the bees are justified and in that speech you mentioned, I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I don't want, you know, killers and pedophiles. I mean, you know, getting away with this kind of thing. Uh, you know, let's have that surveillance technology. Um, of course, there are possibilities for abuse. We all mm. know that. It's the same is true of cops in general, right? <laughs> like, and we know that. And we know that's true. Not... Yeah, and, we, and we've seen that as true as well. So, right. So on that issue, obviously, it touches on it. It's not really interested in exploring it. And I think that's sort of like, yeah, the government's a cunt. Let's move on. Is sort of used as a uh, line to kind of recognize the issue, but then not get bogged down in it and continue yeah. with the thriller. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it is an interesting one, and I think it's an acknowledgement. I think I like the fact that it is acknowledging that we are a surveillance state in this country. Um, London, materially, like predominantly, like if you go to London, um, I believe there are there is no, you know, they could track your entire journey, you know, from tube to tube or whatever you want to do. Um, less so in other cities. I mean, not, not at all where I live. I mean, I live in a village where it's sort of like, you know, there are no cameras, but you go onto the roads. There are cameras mm -hmm. all over the roads. Um, any city is swarming with cameras. Like we, it's just. But like you say, there was this thing of, um, it's a, it's an invasion of privacy. This thing of surveillance, you know, and there is a part of me that goes, yeah, yeah, I understand that. I do completely understand that. But then there's another part of me going like, well, I I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> You know, because, and again, I have to say, and I am saying this as a straight, middle-aged white man, I'm not one of the targeted individuals. And I understand mm -hmm. that there are going to be communities that have a very, very different experience, you know, uh, minority communities in either sort of like the Asian or, you know, um, Afro-Caribbean or the black communities in this country or the Muslim community or whatever, that will be like, yeah, we haven't done anything, but all of a sudden, 50 cameras appear to be now pointing at our mosque. Mm. Why is that? You know? And that would happen. And that and that has yeah. happened over yeah. there. You know? Yeah, totally. Um, so I understand that there's this sort of persecution that goes with it and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult balance. But I'm like you. I'm a bit like, well, if you're not doing anything, I know this sounds very naive and possibly a bit more conservative. If you're not doing anything, what, what does it matter? You know? But you know, as we've had more traffic cameras, I feel more reluctant to speed. Mm. Um, and I used to speed a lot more than I do now. <laughs> I'm sort of like the sort of classic American sort of nobody's going to pull you over for five miles over the limit, you know. Um, you know, so, you know, I see a cop, I sort of slow down, you know, but I, I'm not a big speeder. I know people who still are, but I see these cameras and I, you know, sort of am paranoid. The thing that always gets me is that's not what the police are interested in, right? Mm -hmm. Like we often assume, you know, this kind of like surveillance state is a kind of like overly police state. But, you know, I've found at least so far that that's not true. Now, you're right. If you're a black in New York, they went through stop and frisk, you know, which is still going on to yep. a lesser degree. But, you know, I mean it makes a difference if you're in an over-policed area, mm -hmm. um, you know, but that really has to do with, you know, police resources and why are you bothering to yeah. prosecute these petty crimes just to oppress people? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, so, I, I sort of feel like in an era in which we give, you know, I mean, there are probably 10 companies that can track where all of us are at any given time from our cell phones. Right. And, can see our search engine entries and you know what websites we're looking at they know our kinks they know yeah. what porn we're looking at they know you know way more they can tell that we're pregnant before we know it mm -hmm. you know that i mean you know they they know whether we're bald or not you know they know everything um you know um you know you you like uh, there are these eerie moments there uh where you get an ad for like oh 
why would I need a divorce lawyer? <laughs> like, what yeah. is it that I'm... Was it, like, was, it the, like, is it the, was it that girl, the was it like a 19-year-old that had adverts for prams popping up on her feed? Hmm. And then she was like, and then all of a sudden she found out she was pregnant like a week later and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, this can't... Be, but we live in that world where we willingly give this stuff out to corporations. Yeah. And you're scared of the government. Now, we should have controls and everything else and, you know... Uh, and we should have boards, you know, that are third party that monitor the police and make sure that minorities aren't being persecuted. And you're right. I'm not a trans person living in a state that has outlawed drag. OK, you know, yeah. in a state like that, those cameras are going to be really scary. And somebody who's in a minority population has every right to be more cautious yeah. about this. Um, I really don't get, though, the, you know. The, the Southerner is sitting on his porch going like, I don't want the government, you know. My, yeah, okay. Uh, keep playing Animal Crossing, buddy, you know. Yeah. Uh, tell me. <laughs> They're not coming. That's it. They're not coming for your distillery out the back. I wouldn't worry about it. Like, you know, make, make your moonshine. That's perfectly fine. This isn't the Dukes of Hazard. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting story. And I think, you know, you've got, I've got to know that social perspective as well. So this, the the B thought of being being... Uh, a surveillance thing that I like it as an idea because it would happen, of course, it would happen like 100%. Um, and you know, so that's this instant thing, yeah. Um. And there have been, you know, we've seen in the news these artificial bees, you know, we have an artificial flies and stuff like that. We have this technology, uh, this is being perfected, you know, it's not at the scale. That it is, there. no. But I like the hives being uh, basically three D printers. Yeah, and I love that. Stations. This, yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, and they're like self replicating. I love that when he, he says that they're self replicating. Like they'll they take things and they'll build and like you say three D printers and stuff. Um, and like they're shocked and it's like oh yeah they're gonna multiply like, um, but they don't sting anyone because they're not designed like real bees like you know they aren't dangerous to to humans and stuff like you know. But no, I think that some of this is some of the design work on this is really, really good. Um, I think it's sort of it's well done. And it's true. I mean, that this idea of bees, this is you know, is being discussed. Like the, the, the bee population is is collapsing and people are genuinely worried because it will mean that there's less pollination, which is a big ecological, you know, uh, c- catastrophe. So it's it's a real sort of thing that's being lent into. Um, and I like the fact it has like an ecological message, but I like this fact as well. Again, where when they talk about the surveillance thing, and again the, the the Benedict Wong character, and he says like, "Look, if the government's going to pour like twenty odd million or two billion into this, do you think they're only going to do it for an ecological uh, an ecological thing that's going to gain them two hundred green votes?" Like, no, they were <laughs> doing it for this. Like, you know, like don't be naive. This is what it was all about. Um, and so I like that as well, that like there is that sort of duplicitous about the government, which you know, is, is we know about, but even he's like, don't be daft. Like, this is about money. This is obvious. Like, you know, don't be ridiculous. Yeah. But, um, you know, let's be realistic. I mean, if if we're going to spend a trillion dollars on this nationwide B system and it's going to have this ecological purpose of, you know, resisting uh you know ecological collapse by pollinating you know in as bee population declines um okay wouldn't it be irresponsible not to also use that for surveillance you know you're setting up the system Mm. um you know you know you're paying a lot of money you might as well have them do two things for a little extra money than do one um so what about the social media aspect? And, you know, you were talking about sort of cancel culture and all of this. Um, obviously, that's, you know, the the sort of, you know, one of the main concerns here. Uh, what do you make of that? Where do you stand on the depiction of that aspect here? Um, I think, it's, I think it's, this is interesting. I think it's a fair depiction. I mean, what, what I think is interesting that, is almost uh, it's it's both shown as being sort of um, all hot air, you know, this thing of how, um, but it has real world consequences. And I think we can, you know, you can see that today. How this online hot air, like hashtag death to whoever, 
not only does it go away within 24 hours because it will go from one person to the next of like you know it goes from Joe Powers to the 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 rapper Tusk you know it has this natural progression to whatever someone has done next that 24 hour news cycle but it has real world implications like you know we 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 know people that have lost jobs we know people that have lost you know celebrities that have lost uh, sponsorship deals or like you know had like James Gunn was originally fired from Guardians of the Galaxy for something that was like a tweet that was like 10 years old and all this other shit. Like we've seen this happen where you'd be like, good, and they're like, good, they've lost their job. And you go like, cool, who's feeding their family because they're a bit of a dick? Like, you know, that seems a bit much. Like, you know, I understand that there's sort of, there's, there's this, there is sort of like this case of like, what do you call it now? Like the, 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 the court of public, um, whatever, Opinion. you know. Public opinion, thank you. And it feels very much like that, but it's sort of like it has no follow through. Um, an example being recently is is the case of Jonathan Majors. And I think Disney have treated this a bit differently to how they treated you know, the James Good in the past. Jonathan Majors, you know, he's a good actor. I've enjoyed him in, in a lot of things he's done. Actually, sort of like you know, I think he's been an upcomer. Um, was accused of. Um, um, abuse or, or of you know hitting and sp- uh, hitting his then girlfriend and this other stuff and causing this this fracas that resulted in the police being involved and there's all these people that were like hashtag fire Jonathan Majors or whatever right hashtag death to whatever you know if you want to cut it down that thing all of a sudden he was judged that was it he was done and if that and Disney sort of said so oh, we're going to wait but he lost other things he lost. He was a it was a sponsor of the US Army mm. or the, the face of the US Army campaign and some other things. Gone. Now they're going to trial in August, and a lot of the evidence is actually coming to court. And it's it's blatantly obvious that this woman that he allegedly beat or originally hit was never hit. There's video footage. And if anything, it shows her kicking and scratching at him and doing all this other stuff. And he's the one that called the police. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, this story got blown out of. You know, completely blown the, the wrong way because of this and things. The woman was it automatically um, believed because you know believed the victim, and she made herself out to be the victim. But now this evidence is coming out, and it's been it's in the news, but you don't see it online because there's no like mm. justice for Jonathan or anything like that. You know, justice for majors. And so I do feel that this is no, there's no follow through, and there needs to be because they're a bit like oh that's old news. That was like February when it happened. Like it's old news. We don't talk about that anymore. And you're like, well, you you should do, because you've got to follow through. So, I appreciate that this actually shows the the quick turnaround. And then when they go and confront the teacher about it, this woman that had that that put up one of these hash these death two hashtags when she's like, oh, I was only a joke. It's only sort of like, and then she says, I'm, I'm I'm just expressing my free speech. And it's this thing, isn't it, about consequenceless free speech. Um, mm-hmm. and so I find all that fascinating. So I do, I do think it's a pretty fair representation of the callousness, but also the dismiss, almost like dismissiveness of of the, of the sort of cancel culture. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I haven't followed that John Major's case, but um, you know, I take your your word, and I am very sympathetic to these complaints. Um, now, I mean. Over the last few days, I watched, because I'm this kind of, you know, nerd, I watched a C-SPAN uh, discussion about Philip Roth, who I love, mm. but who, you know, has been accused of misogyny in his writings, which I think is, uh, you know, that's fair. Um, and, you know, problems with his marriages, things like this, and has defenders and critics and everything. Um but ne- ne- never a sort of Me Too stuff. Maybe he would have been had he lived longer. But, um, you know, he, he certainly did have affairs with students. But he wrote a book as a liberal, right? I mean, you know, he wrote a book um, in which uh, Coleman Silk, a professor, is, says, um, you know, uh, are these missing students in class real or are they spooks? And he means ghosts. But it's interpreted as a racist term for black people, and he's mm. fired, and um, or or forced out. And the twist is that he actually is black himself and has been passing, uh, and so it's kind of a passing novel. 
so anyway, there was this discussion of this, um, which I, I, I love that novel. But in this discussion, um, I, a couple things come to mind that I'd like to share. One was um, that when we discuss these things, it's quite important to remember that, at least in this country, the people who are canceling books are people on the right. Yeah. Nobody on the left is out canceling, you know, is taking books from libraries, right? They're mostly exercising free speech, saying, like, this person's a dick. They shouldn't have this job. That's very different from incarcerating somebody or using the mechanisms of the state to mm. oppress that person, as in the case of passing laws against trans books and, you know, black books and things like this. So that is unique to the right. Um, having said that, um, a, a, another panel member brought up how her students are concerned about um, saying the wrong thing on Twitter uh, or social media and having a Twitter mob attack them and that everybody knows somebody who's been through this and that even, you know, even young people, even liberal people live in fear that they will be perceived as saying the wrong thing or use the wrong expression, the wrong term and a phrase, that if it manages for whatever reason in the zeitgeist of that particular day to ignite that mob, you know, and I've seen this, suddenly it becomes a story and suddenly it gains momentum and then everybody's, you know, saying, you know, uh, how terrible this person is or how mm. disgusting this is and really blowing things out of proportion and that there is a climate of fear um, that has been created in especially young people, but probably everybody, um, not just conservatives, but, you know, liberal people, too. And I think this depicts that relatively well. I think that um, like that, you know, the right wing journalist who basically criticized the handicapped person at the beginning. We don't know what that article really was. It could have been some legitimate points. It could have been ugly. Um, but. You know, certainly I, I can't wait for that bitch to die and stuff like this is out of line. Mm. And strangely, we, we don't have social media platforms that, you know, take that seriously and censor that. Um, and the movement, especially under jerks like Elon Musk, has been away from censorship rather than, you know, towards that kind of creating a, a safe space that allows for freedom of speech, but still, you know, protects this kind of thing. Um, and I think the, uh, like the Tusk thing is just, you know, he was rude to a kid he didn't know was backstage, okay? I mean, he was not handling that well. That's a bad interview. He was insensitive to a kid, you know, like it. That, nobody deserves death. No, that. that was one of the, I was watching that and thinking, that's not bad on Tusk. That's a bad producer somewhere who's gone, this is a good idea for the show. And I'm going, this seems like you would know the kind of person Tusk would be. Mm. Like, this shouldn't be a shock. Like, you know. Um, he's busting on a kid. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't bring on a kid yeah. that's going to be like, oh, we're going to bring him out now. Like, that That feels like Tusk was almost set up to be, mm. you know, like, you go, yeah. So right. That's like, you know, that's like bringing someone like, notoriously grumpy on like John Cleese or someone like that. And then saying like, and here we have an ultra left sort of like, you know, funny wants to talk to you about faulty towers. Like, yeah, of course that's going to go badly. Like, you know, it, yeah. Or, or what do you think about this person's opinions? Would it surprise you to know that they're dying of cancer? You know, yeah. like, what, why are you doing? Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, but it, it could happen. Like, this is the thing, isn't it? People yeah. jump on this thing. And I also think, sorry, just to, 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 to railroad your point, I apologize. But you say there yeah. about this, this culture of fear. Mm -hmm. I also think that this culture of fear also produces a culture of bandwagon jumping because mm -hmm. that's the safest option. Where you'll look at the trends and it'll be like, hashtag death Joe Powers or hashtag death of Tusk. And people will be like, well, I'm not going to contradict them because I don't want the same backlash, so I'm going to jump on that as well. You know, that sort of thing. Because I cannot believe, especially in, in, in either of our countries, that 
if you were to have, let's say she's a, a right wing opinion piece, you know, journalist, yes, there'd be a lot of people going, that's disgusting. I'm pretty sure you'd have other people going, no, I'm fully on board with what she's saying. I think she's completely right. And da da da. So, like, I don't think I've ever seen any journal, any piece written where, you know, it could be inflammatory and people will go, that's really, really terrible and wrong. But you're still going to get its defenders. You always do. So, you know, it'll never be 100% whatever death to. But, um, it's enough for you to jump on the back. Some people to jump on the bandwagon because they still want to be an online presence, but they don't want to be stood out too much. They, they're different to the main mm. opinion. Well, and I also think that, you know, it's interesting that you brought that up with Joe Powers that I, I also think that she would probably not get that kind of backlash. Mm. Un- unfortunately, what happens is in both of our countries, because, you know, both sides kind of like perceive the other side as crazy and doing that stuff. It's much yes. more uh, purging your own party. So in a weird way, it's like, you know, lifelong liberals who said the wrong thing, you know, or, or maybe they did say something that you should have a conversation about. Again, Twitter and, and social media has been used for all kinds of good stuff and giving mm. people a voice. And, and there is stuff that's legitimate to criticize. But in a weird way, it would be the center left columnist who wrote the this handicap thing has gone too far. This person isn't a hero. You know, the way we talk about everybody as a hero. You're not a hero because you're suffering from a disease. OK, yeah. you know, that's I mean, this is stupid. Again, all compassion and empathy. But, you know, I mean, you're not a hero because you served in the military automatically you're not a hero because you're a firefighter or a hero because you're a teacher either um your occupation doesn't make you a hero but in a weird way i would think that it would be a center left person who just says that unorthodox thing that would then get that hatred meanwhile donald trump is out there saying crazy stuff nobody's no, it's, that it's, stuff it's, about it's, him because you know, it's what they expect assumes that you will act that way right and that's the thing i think it's an expectation isn't it if you have like a white right wing commentator, Alex Jones, you don't have uh, articles and hatred towards Alex Jones every day because he might be saying spiteful and horrible things, like you know, like he's been taken to he was taken to court and charged with everything against sort of Sandy Hook and all that kind of thing. Said all that, but you don't get all this stuff every day because he says it every day. So there's like, okay, you're right. That kind of backlash that is, is that Joe Powers received would be for someone when you go like, wow, that came out of nowhere. You know, Keir Starmer's come out and admitted he likes to kick puppies for hot, you know, as, as a Saturday afternoon ho- hobby. Like, Jesus, that's out of nowhere. Like, you know, it, it, it needs to be that, doesn't it? Otherwise, it's, hey, it's just another thing in the cycle of, of nutters <laughs> that goes on. Yeah. And and I think the, the worst example of just a sort of tempest in a teapot is the third person who has pretended to urinate on a memorial. Who gives a shit? Do you know what people do to memorials every day? You know, they get spray painted and people take silly photos with them. And, you know, I mean, like, this is barely even in bad taste, right? Mm. Like, but I can completely see, in that case, more of a right-wing mob, you know. Um, I mean, I can see, you know, right-wing mobs have attacked, you know, online people who, you know, did it salute the the flag or you know didn't behave in a patriotic enough way or something i mean they went after barack obama for putting his foot feet up on the desk and the color suit that he wore for god's sake i mean yeah you know that one just seems especially just utterly ridiculous um but i I think it's i can't imagine somebody it taking off for a while exactly i think that's the point is i think this one is one of those ones where it's um I think it's supposed to, they chosen a relatively frivolous one to sort of highlight the point that mm-hmm. someone's a really, on a slow news day, you know, when a rapper hasn't treated a kid like crap, somebody else is still going to be in the firing line, but they may not be as bad. I lo- I also like this to, to go to the other top five, when they show the top five, and it's the minister um, of whatever at the top, the, the guy at the top, and he's talking about one of his colleagues and his colleagues. And he's like, the you know, um, he's like, he's number three and he's a known pedophile. <laughs> 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 and, 
and they're like, well, you know, it's not, he hasn't been convicted or he hasn't been charged. And they're like, he's like, it's irrelevant. They know it's true. You know, it's true. And he's pointing to the people like, you know, in his team and they're going to, he comes to that point of going like, well, we've got that letter still, haven't we? We've still got that memo or something that this other guy wrote mm-hmm. at one point. Mm-hmm. Leak it, leak it. Like I want him above me. Like I'm willing to do anything. Like that's <laughs> that's real. Like the thick of it kind of level politics where they're like you know, um, smearing each other to try and sort of make sure that the other looks worse than the other. Sort of. Um, I found that kind of interesting as well because that's that was the bit that felt like um, the national anthem mm. when they're mm-hmm. looking at and the one guy's going like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, you're not dead yet. We've still got a couple of hours until five p.m. We'll find another solution, and I, I almost, I almost, what I was almost hoping there'd be a well, waiting didn't work well for, you know, mm. the you know prime, the minister, prime minister, the prime minister, or something like yeah. that, or like they'll yeah. give him his name, like you know, this is actually a following those events. Um, yeah, I liked all that as well, where there's those machinations going on in the background of going like, well, we've got to smear that guy even worse, so to get his numbers up, um. So yeah, I like all that as well. This idea of um, your social media, your 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 sort of like public persona, the way you're perceived by the public, can be quite damaging to you. You know, in in reality, really. Um, yeah, and there are a few little Easter eggs to other episodes. Like you know, that they, they they like to do this with like the news tickers that you know mention like that that mass technology you know is like mm. snuck in there and little things like that. And again, it's kind of hard to assemble them into a shared universe, but I, but I kind of, and I don't know that they need to be, but I do see your point. And I, and I like the sort of, you know, it's almost like a shorthand here for like, oh yeah, politicians care about their numbers and not much else and are ruthless. You know, I already yeah. did that story, but you know, here it is in shorthand. Yeah. Yeah. It is five minute segment. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. Um, But I like all this because I think this is about this escalation. Like we've talked about this stuff. And uh, to go back to sort of this idea that I like the fact that the way this escalates from the simple idea of a murder mystery and then builds up to this sort of, like you say, this this apocalyptic event. Um, and it's done well. I think, you know, you said there's the blue is a little bit of a, of an OP. I think she's overpowered a little bit on a technological side. And there's, this, there's moments where I'm like, all right, you've done that a bit quick and all sort of stuff, but I'm willing to let it go just to keep the story momentum going. Um, but the other thing is, like you say, it all works. The one thing I was that, that I thought was that came to mind is there was a moment at the end when um, Benedict Wong's character sort of like, you know, they've put the code in and they're sort of like, but there's a chance that it could do this, this and this. And he's like, oh, and he presses the button. And he's like, I'm sorry, mm. but it had to be done. Like we had to sort of stop this. And they think it's worked. And then the screen starts going red, like the hives start turning red and stuff. And I thought it was very good. And then it pans out and you have the bees sort of like coming out of the hives and you see these sort of clouds of bees across like the city and stuff. And again, I thought it was very effective. It's very well done. But because of the Britishness of this and because of this sci-fi sort of trope, I thought it made me think of like Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is the moment that like the Doctor would come up with some like gobbledygook techno babble nonsense that was able to stop the bees or bring them all to a certain location or something, save everybody. I was like, but this isn't that. And I kind of like that mm-hmm. it has that, but like you said, but the, the, but it is, they don't win. You know, they solve the crime. They know they solve the murders, like who was the murderer, but they don't stop the genocide or they don't stop the attack. Um, and that's the bit I like. Like, there's no sort of like, there's not left with like the one second left on the clock for them to stop it. Like, no, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. four hundred thousand people were killed off at the off the back of this. Um, and so I, I, I do really like the way this escalates and 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 uh, culminates in that that moment. No, I agree very much. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, that all works very well. The other thing is the number of twists that this has. Mm. Um, Again, very thriller-like, where it's like, okay, we got the guy, you know, well, he was alerted because he saw, you know, this this post about him, um, you know, that comes back later, you know, um, all right, well, we got the hard drive, we've solved it, no, actually, we've triggered the, 
apocalyptic event. Mm. You know, uh, my partner has killed herself. Well, actually, she's alive and getting revenge. You know, I mean, there's really quite, you know, a, a lot of plot here. When mm. you think about it with lots of sort of dramatic twists. But they're dramatic. What I think of this as a thriller, I think about how these are dramatic twists. At no point, except for the the bees are actually surveillance, which, you know, is pretty obvious. But except for that, there's no twist that is technological. All yeah. of these are classic thriller plot twists. At no point is it like, aha, we're in a virtual reality. Aha, you know, nothing is what you th you thought. None of these are the, the classic Twilight Zone or um, Black Mirror twists. These are just, you know, thriller plot twists. And I think that Brooker handles it fantastically. Yeah. I think this is a probably... It's, it's from a scope point of view and a plot point of view. I think this is the most successful I've seen to date. Hmm. Um, I think I would say that, you know, quite handily that I think this is the, the most well handled from a plot perspective because of that, the most well laid out. I haven't got niggles, you know, where I'm going like, well, how does this work in the rest of the world? You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 even though I'm like, I'm quite comfortable there would probably be people all over the world contributing to this hashtag, but they're still like, no, that because mm -hmm. it's obviously this is a right. U this is a UK based thing, so he's using IP addresses to, to target only UK um people. So I'm like, cool, all right, happy with that. That sounds fine. This hasn't been distributed across the world yet. So it all works, it all feels fine, it all feels of a piece, and it, I'm I'm happy with all those twists. None of the twists sort of like ruin anything that's gone before sometimes you get twists where you go that feels really disjointed from something that was happening in the first yeah. act or something like that like this feels all like a continuation of, the... of a piece yeah exactly yeah 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 i mean i if, if i'm looking for things to complain about i would point out that you know these government secret files on everybody along with their geolocation instantly available um you know it, you know comes about a bit quickly Mm. Um, you know, I don't know that that exists. Um, you know, but right. I mean, but I would uh kind of that's sort of just done for plot convenience and it's ex explained away and that they can access this, you know, it's just explained away with a line of dialogue and I'm willing to let that go. Yeah. I mean, we've already accepted a lot and, you know, I mean, it's not the biggest deal. And in a and if this were like adapted into a feature length movie with more of a Hollywood budget, maybe they could have massaged that a little. But this is remarkably close to that. Mm. To me, this is not one of my favorite episodes, though. And you know, so to me, you like this, I think, more than I do. And mm. I think that this is sort of a master class in a thriller. I don't know. I have seen it before. I have not carried a strong memory of it. Mm. Um, I don't think that it lingers on in the imagination. And I think partly because it's not as strong on the sci-fi angle. It doesn't have a lot to say except, you know, bullying on social media and, you know, He's wrong. mobs or cancel culture is kind of questionable. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't really have anything to say and it doesn't have any kind of real exploration of technology except mm. a take on robot bees, right? So I think in a way it's the most, I would say it's the most conventional Black Mirror episode. Mm. And it works on those conventional levels of a thriller. But it doesn't feel like the strongest Black Mirror episode to me, in part because it is so unconventional for Black Mirror and so conventional as a standard narrative. Um and I think that I remember other episodes that were emotionally affecting or that explore technology more than I do. Oh, yeah, that's that time that you did a really good thriller with yeah. some sci-fi elements. Like, kudos to you. You can do it. High marks on your scorecard. But, you know, it's still good. But Yeah, I know, I know, I know what you mean. I understand what you mean. Like, you know, there are ones that probably have shakier stories, but explore things in a more interesting way or pack more of a punch at the end or have something more to say thematically or something. I think the reason I think the reason is I like this is because I think the story's laid out so well and it works so well. I like the sci-fi elements, don't get me wrong, I really do. 
But I think one of the things I've been un- until this point, even with sort of like some of the ones we've spoken about more recently, I've been harboring this sort of like suspicion that um, the attention and the the adulation that Black Mirror gets is a little overrated or a little bit of hype. Because I'm watching this and going, yeah, I, I like the ideas, but they shouldn't be an hour long. The writing's not great. Some of the storytelling's a bit wobbly and whatever and sometimes like the ending you know there'll be one element that we're like one bit's great but then the next the, re- the next bit's crap or like you know and then i got this and i'm like oh they- i guess they've toned down the sort of you know the satire um science fiction satire but they've laid out a really good cop driven plot and I'm like, I'm all good for that. Like, I really enjoyed following along on this. It got me hooked. So I think I'm, I'm appreciating this more because I, I am getting more from the story, um, which has always been one of my things. So, yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I I understand exactly what you're saying. It doesn't have that same sort of, like, uh, wallop that I think some of the others have. And I, I definitely feel that there are episodes that have that that will last longer in the memory or the imagination. But I don't know, there's something about this that felt special to me. So we shall see how, how you maybe it's one of those when we get to the end and I'm at, you know, we'll go like, which one stick with you? Does it actually mm. stick with me? You know, do I still remember it then? It'd be interesting. Well, while I don't have any final thoughts here, I'd like to ask you a question, mm. um, which is that we've talked about sort of your concern that season three would be different and would be a kind of like Americanizing of Black Mirror with more money but possibly more superficial not necessarily as satisfying and i know those the sort of first half of the season seem to cement that for you i think the back half of the season has been much more satisfactory to both of us Mm -hmm. um and i wonder how you feel about those concerns especially that i think it's nice that they had one british episode it's like we haven't forgotten our roots you know here's your solid british episode so how how would no. you stand now? As I look back, I think it's that episode Nosedive. Now, I know you like that episode a lot more than I do, but I'm looking at that and going, it's the first one that Netflix was presenting. It's a very, it felt like a very American plot, the, the whole sort of like social um, reward thing and all that kind of thing. Starring Bryce Dallas Howard it looks like it's got money, you know. It felt like that was almost like a statement of intent. It was almost like a reassurance that we're going. No, no, no. We Netflix have got it. We're going to give this some proper attention. Um, and in, in doing so, it's almost like they tried too hard. Um, play test again felt a little bit of that, but oh, again, like you know, and it, and it it sort of fails in some of the things it does, but it's still better for me. But the uh, stand up and dance, or shut up and dance, what it was called, the, that the third one, that one really hit me, and I was like, oh no, this feels like we're back in old territory. Like, if anything, as I said in the episode, this feels like this could have easily been in his back pocket as a continuation if they'd have done it on Channel Four. Like, you know, it's low budget. Like, I say it's set in Britain. It's quite seedy. It's got all those different things about uh, yeah, how you in, you know, who do you see as the antagonist or the, the you know the protagonist in the story and then when you learn more about them how do you feel that was really good and i was like you know it made us ask some really difficult questions and what was funny is as i've been going through these i've said about these lists that i've been looking at of people's ranking of the episodes i saw one where someone ranked this down as all that one that stand up and and shut up and dance or stand up and dance as one of their least favorite episodes because it made them feel uncomfortable and i'm like that's sort of <laughs> I was like, that's the kind of the point in that in that case, it's really successful. <laughs> yeah. Like, surely that's a good thing. Um, and then as you said, you carry on to this last sort of the second half of of, of series three, and it that sort of feeling continues where I'm watching um again, like you know, that San um uh Juniper Nero, like that feels like that where I'm like, oh, okay, this feels like Brooker. He's gone for some sentimentality. This, you know, maybe there's a little bit that he's been asked to add it a bit more sentimental towards. Yeah, you know, the ending feels a lot more sentimental, but it's a well done episode. And then you get Men Against Fire and um, Hates in the Nation, and I'm like, oh no, you are doing 
good stuff. Like this is this is good stuff again. Like you know, people really rave about that nosedive, but I still think, all in all, I honestly think it's the weakest episode in season three. I think it's overblown, overwritten, and overproduced, hmm. um, and the rest feel a lot more, a lot closer to what I want, and you know, give me something that I'm, I'm really looking, I'm really looking for, and I think a more successful. Yeah, I don't agree. I, I don't disagree that it is uh, a, a weaker episode. Um, I would say it's very important not to start your new season, especially on a new network, with an episode titled "Not Sure Nose We dove. Can Do It on This Bigger Stage." You know, yeah. like maybe yeah. not the best choice there. Um, so, I mean, all I need to know—not that Netflix represents my identity as an American—is that we have done right by your material as a Brit. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I take no ownership of this, but I, <laughs> what what I would say is though, I think one of the one of the reasons that the first two seasons were successful, and I feel that Charlie Brooker is is able to is that there is that British sort of like cynicism that that, you know, is just a part of our culture, it's a part of our nature. Um you know, you hear this of like, well, what is what is British culture? What is English culture? We're a cynical bunch of bastards. Like we expect everything to be shit. That's just the way things are. That's why we talk about the weather because it's always shit. Um. So yeah, no, it, it, it has that sort of thing. There's downbeat endings and that sort of thing of like the hero or the the person you're following and you want to succeed, like not succeeding, or that twist at the end that really sort of like you know makes you feel then uncomfortable about the story you've been told or something like all that from the first couple of seasons is like, Oh no, I'm, I'm liking all that. That's good stuff. Um, what I would say is actually by the time we've gotten to hated in the nation, um, I'm like, Oh, he's, he's really hit stride. Like I'm looking back and going those first two seasons or across the first three seasons. Yeah. There's a couple of episodes that are really, really good that we keep referencing because of how good they are. But there's some real dross as well. You know, there's a couple of episodes I'm looking back and going like, I can't keep saying how good this is as a show without, you know, like it's got really good highs, but then you have, um, just to remind myself, you know, um, well, the, I think the first series is really well, good. White actually. Bear is. White Bear, yeah. that's the one I'm thinking of. Like White yeah. Bear is so poor to me uh, in a real low point. Um that yeah, I'm like yeah, there's still you know even in the first season like although I like I think the national anthem is interesting, I still think it's a relatively weak episode overall, uh, in that when you compare it to the rest. So there are some weak points, but I think it, it, as it's gone on, it's maintained um, that sensibility or that sensibility has crept back in, and it's sort of like you know the executives at uh, Netflix were reassured by the first two episodes. <laughs> And then that sensibility sort of like came back in. I'm 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 more interested to see what's coming because I'll just say that mm-hmm. I'll mention this. When you look at this on IMDB, which is where I use a lot of the sort of the references to sort of like to look at to go through the episodes, those first two, nose dive and play test, are represented as their little picture by like a, mm-hmm. a poster, like a like a, almost like a, an EC comics poster mm-hmm. uh thing of the for the show you know but then uh should have been dance san juniper um junipero man against fire and hated nation aren't like they just go back to this sort of like a, a, a picture from an image from the show so it's weird how they're starting there but then when you go to the next series series four um every episode has got its own poster and so, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean if they've gone to some sort of another level of, like, treating each one like an, a, a film, you know, story kind of thing? So I'm interested to see how that, com- what you know, what we're going to get out of that. I do think that's the trend as the as the series continues. Yeah. That the episodes kind of get more ambitious. And, and I also think that's a trend in marketing that uh, episodes kind of get their own posters, especially in series where, you know, a season is rarer Mm. and there aren't as many episodes. Um, Yeah, but it's interesting to me how 
diff- how much we agree <laughs> in our ratings mm. uh, and how, you know, because you're right, of course, Scott, um, and how uh, different we seem to be than some of these other, um, you know. The main, the main consensus. Lists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I do agree. I think we are outliers when it comes to this. So it'll be interesting. I am actually going to do at the end of all this. I think I'm going to put a list together, and it might be worth publishing it on you know on on the website on Twenty Century Geek to just put it out there as being like, I want to list my 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 the ranking of my episodes out, and maybe we'll do yours, and I'll just put some justification against it because I'm interested to say this is why. Like, come and see the episodes. I think we, we're laying out why we think these episodes are weaker than others. Um, I don't know. But I think some people just automatically praise them. I see it on there in reviews, and it's like, you know, an example of the best kind of science fiction ever presented. And I'm like, your your exposure to good science fiction is really <laughs> limited. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's surely the case. Well, I, I the Black Mirror rap will be fun when we eventually get yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that will be interesting. Right, anyway, we shall wrap up there. Uh, so anyway, this has been series three of Black Mirror. And we, as we continue off into uh, the series, we're starting with the USS Callista in season four. So that'd be the next one coming up. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what we're doing, please leave a review uh, on your podcast catcher, preferably five stars. We really greatly appreciate it. Makes people aware of us and our, you know, right or wrong opinions about the things that we're talking about, whatever you think. Um, right. Yeah, right. Right. Always. Yeah. We are the voice of right. Do not forget that. Um, we are the arbiters of good taste. That's very really true. Yes, um, especially in the well in the in the realms of science fiction. There are many other things where I have terrible <laughs> taste. Um, but if you please come and find us at Pod Time Space on uh, on Twitter, uh, and you know find us on the Twentieth Century Geek on other social media. Uh, but also we have the Patreon www.patreon.com forward slash two zero CG media. And we do a whole host of things on there. Twilight zone, uh, additional bonus material for main feed, 30 second, 30 second, 30 minute thoughts and a load of other stuff. Go check out a bunch of extra material and lots of interaction with our patrons. Uh, but for now, Julian, thank you very much. This has been a great, uh, great discussion. Uh, My pleasure as always, Scott. Yeah, it's been great. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode. streams.